If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. We have a very special guest today. You're not going to see him in person, but you're going to see him on videotape. Dr. Peter Kraft, who's a professor of philosophy at Boston College in uh, Boston. And Peter Herbeck had a chance to interview him while he was visiting our seminary recently. And we're doing a, a number of programs with him this season. Peter, tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear from Dr. Kraft today. We're well, covering two primary subjects. What is truth? And what is the sexual revolution, the impact that it's had on us and our church and our culture? Okay, well, let's take a look at our first segment. Dr. Crave, what is truth? Oh, that's an easy one. That's one of the easiest questions in the world to answer. Everybody knows what truth is. Truth is telling it like it is. Truth is your words and thoughts corresponding to reality. My saying that two and two are four and the sky is blue and your name is Peter, that's true. My saying that two and two are one and that the sky is purple and that your name is Jesus, that's false. Now, we're living in a, in a cultural milieu and in an intellectual climate in the West that says, if someone's gonna make a truth claim, what they're doing is Im simply imposing their will on another and they're expressing intolerance, they're being uh, discriminatory, cultural imperialism, you know, acts of violence, whatever it is, because there's an assumption that in some cases that there is no truth or that if there is, it just can't be known. Mm -hmm. And so at best you have a perspective and you're just pushing your perspective on people. Well, there's a difference between two different kinds of relativism and skepticism and, and subjectivism there. One is that truth exists, but it can't be known. We're not smart enough. The other is that truth doesn't even exist. And any claim of truth is an act of violence. The first is just over humble skepticism. Uh, I can have sympathy for that. The person who is so suspicious of truth claims that he wants to be humble and, and back away uh, and say, I might be wrong, so I'm not going to take a chance. He's a coward, but at least he's a normal human being. Yeah. Uh, but the subjectivist who says, that's my truth or your truth, and what right do you have to impose your truth on me? That's subjectivism. And that says not that nobody can be right, but that nobody can be wrong. Everything is truth. Yeah. There is no such thing as error except your position that says there is such a thing as error. That's the only error. How can you demonstrate philosophically that there is truth? I'm not sure this is true or not, but I suspect it is. Most of philosophy is amenable to logic. Uh, this denial of truth itself is so insane, I don't think a logician is called for. I think you need an exorcist. <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> <laughs> this is just crazy. Yeah. Now, there's a, there's a spiritual reality, I think, that's connected to the denial of truth. And I'm wondering if Romans 1 doesn't give us some hint of that. You know, Romans 1, the passage where Paul says, the wrath of God is coming against people in the world who by uh, consciously suppress the truth it. about God. Yes. Yeah. That's not ignorance. That's ignoring. That's not a, a, a fault of the intellect. That's a fault of the will. To ignore something is an act of the will that makes the intellect not look at the truth that it knows is there, but it's, it's unwelcome. In that passage, Paul says that they're without excuse because... Because they know. Because the mind, the, rational way, the way we're made, we can actually know something about God through his creation. Is that true? Because a lot of people deny that. You say, you can't know anything about God through, mat, you know, in this material world we live in. The vast majority of all human beings who have ever lived on this planet have believed in a God for two reasons, order in nature and conscience. They know that they didn't make the world and the world is an amazing place. And they know that their moral obligations didn't come from their little games that they make up. 
but they're under those obligations. They may not know who God is. Their theologies may be all mixed up, but they know that they're living in an ordered creation and in an ordered moral universe. In other words, Genesis 1 and Exodus 20 are in everybody's Bible. What's in Genesis 1? The order of creation. What's in Exodus 20? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Now, how does that, how does conscience work exactly? You say everybody has a conscience. Mm -hmm. And what is the simplest way to understand conscience? Conscience is the knowledge of good and evil. The knowledge, first of all, that good and evil exist. Secondly, the difference between them. Thirdly, which things are good and which things are evil. Everybody has a conscience. You can suppress that. You can try to have a conscienceectomy, yeah. but you can't succeed. Yeah. There are certain things that you can't not know. Yeah. For example? That murder is bad that for me to deliberately kill you, even though you don't deserve it, is a bad thing. That's a violation of the golden rule. That's not just culturally formed into people. Uh, it's somehow present in every, every... society in history has that. In fact, it goes farther than that. Every society in history says you should go beyond just justice and equality and the golden rule. You should love people. You should be merciful. You find that not just in Christianity. You find that in almost every culture. In, in Romans 1, it go, Paul goes from talking about uh, that we consciously suppress the truth, so we're guilty. I mean, that this isn't just, like you say, invincible ignorance. This is, this is real choice. And then he said that as a result, God gives you over to what you want, and you exchange the truth of God for a lie, and then you start to commit um, you know, all kinds of sins that come as a consequence of idolatry, of refusing to acknowledge God. And you feel good about them, and you rationalize them, and then you become addicted to them, and it's much harder to, to be separated from them. Where do you see that happening in our culture today? Sex, which is obviously very attractive and very addictive. And in its proper and natural form, it's liberating and pure and an icon of God. And the holier thing is, when it's twisted, the unholier thing is. The black mass is probably the most horrible thing that you could see on the earth because the mass is the most beautiful thing. Similarly, badly twisted sex can do an enormous amount of harm. It's very interesting in that passage, the first thing he refers to that happens when our, when our senseless minds are darkened is kind of the language I think he uses, is that men start having sexual desire for men and women start having sexual desire yeah. for women. Yeah. And it's seen as a consequence, is there a direct relationship between the suppression of the truth of being and of God himself and our incapacity to grasp gender our own gen and our own nature? Yes, because the devil hates nature as well as God. So he wants to twist our human nature and he wants to get us addicted to unnatural things, not just natural things. Mm. So if we can have unnatural sex, that's addiction to darkness. Uh, you remember the scene in the movie, The Shining, where uh, Jack Nicholson goes upstairs in this abandoned hotel in the middle of winter uh, and, and sees demons and they're all horribly unnatural, face of a man, body of a dog, or vice versa. Uh, the devil just hates nature, mm -hmm. hates natural pleasure, natural sex, natural bodies, natural anything. The devil's real? If he isn't, Jesus is a fool, because he not only said a lot about him, he met him and conquered him. Yes, and the devil is present in the world. I think First John says, the whole world is in the power of the devil. Isn't that one of these hyperbolic, you know, statements that are in the Bible? Well, that's like saying uh, all of human nature is permeated with sin. It doesn't mean we're as bad as we possibly can be, but it means there's no limits. It's, it, it's spread through everything. There's no Garden of Eden anymore. There's no protected enclave that's innocent. So there's a, when the, when the Bible talks about the world, what exactly does it mean by the world? Does it not mean the, the planet God the, created? No, not the planet. There's two words. Uh, one is uh, Gaia, which is the planet Earth, and that's good. But the word Ion, which means uh, era or or world order, that's the bad kind of world, the fallen world order. Yeah. C.S. Lewis mentions in Mere Christianity that the idea that you know talks about how civilizations start out you know well and good intention, good things happen, but they always clonk out. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Look at the history of revolutions. They always start with idealism. You know, power to the people, liberty, fraternity, equality. There was even some idealism in, in some of the Nazis. But it always turns bad. Yeah. There's something that uh, in human nature itself that makes us attracted to the bad. 
if we could do it on our own, if our ideals are, were capable of being realized, God wouldn't have had to send Jesus. You don't need a, a, a repair in a house that, that's uh, in good condition. So did Jesus come to fix the world? He came to fix everything. He came to fix most fundamentally our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Pope Benedict said at the beginning of his book on Jesus, uh, he's talking to his Jewish friend, Rabbi Klausner, and the rabbi says, we Jews don't believe Jesus was the Messiah, uh, however great a person he was, because he left the world uh, the same way he found it. What did he give to the world that the world didn't have before? You still had Roman oppression and tyranny. You still had people suffering and dying and getting sick. Uh, and the Pope said, he gave the world God. That's what we need. Oh, that's beautiful. He gave the world God. Yeah. And the only, the only salvation for the human race is God. Yeah. You know, that, and that was the testimony of in 1 John, the beginning of it. And he said, what we've seen, what we've heard, we want to, what we've touched, we come to tell you that the eternal life that was with the Father has actually appeared yeah. on the earth. You know? And that's why we have to be judgmental and discriminative, because there are false gods. And we have to discriminate between the true God and false gods, between light and darkness. What are the major false gods you see in our culture today? Oh, they're the same old ones. Yeah, nothing uh, new? No, the devil has limited imagination. Greed and pride and lust. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Idolatries. Sure. The commandments don't change, so disobediences to them don't change. Yeah. It's funny how things seem new, but they really aren't. Well, it's amazing that so many people, especially young people, seem to be liberated when they break the bounds of traditional morality. It's as if they're coming out of a cave. Yeah. And it's exactly the opposite. They're crawling into a, a, a smaller world. Yeah. Not God's world, but their own little world. Well, Peter, he, he sure gives kind of pretty pithy answers to <laughs> yeah. questions, doesn't he? Yeah, he gets to the bottom line, doesn't yeah, he? He's, yeah. he's very quick to it. Yeah. And, and, uh, but I appreciate the distinctions. I find them very helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think he's a, a great gift to the church and uh, so glad he's there at Boston College trying to help some of those students kind of get on the narrow way that leads to life. Yeah. It's surprising, Ralph, how, how, uh, how much common sense there is in what he's saying. Yeah. It's like, he said, well, what is truth? Well, it's correspondence to reality. Is what yeah. Does what you're saying and what you believe correspond to reality or yeah. not? But that sounds almost revolutionary these days. Yeah. You know? Well, let's hear some more from Dr. Kreeft. The sexual revolution. You mentioned at one point you thought that the sexual revolution that we've undergone in our country and in the West might be the most powerful revolution in 2,000 years. Why do you say that? Well, political revolutions only are revolutions about how you live life in public, but sexual revolution is about life itself and its origin. Yeah. Uh, sex used to be seen as something sacred, a great sacred mystery, uh, something essentially connected with life and children, uh, not just recreational. Of course it was fun, it's always been that. And of course it's always been very attractive and hard to control, that's not new. But the, it's not so much the new behavior, although that too, but the new philosophy of sex. It's just a game that we play for, for our, our private amusement. It has no public consequences, has nothing to do with society or children, it's just me. Mm -hmm. Some people think the sexual revolution was kind of an overall advance, you know, for society. How would you answer that? Well, just as advanced tooth decay is an advance, <laughs> so that is an advance, but in what direction? Yeah. In the direction of apparent freedom, freedom from constraint, freedom from self-control freedom from objective truth about it. Mm -hmm. But that's not real freedom because you can't have freedom without truth. Why? Because freedom is positive, not just negative. Freedom is not just nihilism. Freedom is not just anything goes and nothing counts. Freedom is the freedom to become the happy whole person that we could be and are meant to be. But freedom is, is expressed now in our, our country is in many ways by people is it's self-creation. Uh, yeah. I, I, get to, well, that's I, get to, that's the, I get to design my life and design my reality. That's the wonder of life. That's, that's the precisely road to the devil's definition of freedom. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. So there's no freedom. When you said there's no freedom without the truth. Yeah. Break that open a little bit. Well, what do you mean? The truth about who you are and who your end is. The two truths that Jesus showed us. The nature of man and the nature of God. Uh, if it if God exists and if God is our creator and our final end, then we have to know him, both with the intellect and with the heart. We have to know the truth because that's our true end, our true destiny. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus is so important. He shows us that. But is, it, is truth and the freedom that I gain from knowing the truth, 
uh, about my own life, isn't it something that I personally am involved in defining for myself, or is it something that I receive? Is it something I create, or is it something I receive? Well, if you create it, then it's just a game. Then it's not really serious. But let's play tiddlywinks, let's play baseball, it doesn't really matter. Nothing is intrinsically good or evil. No. And then there's no moral dimension to truth. There's no responsibilities to truth. It's just for pleasure. If, on the other hand, you receive it, and everybody knows that we receive it, you can't be a scientist without believing in objective truth. There's a, there's a whole universe out there, and you didn't invent it, and you can't change it. And then the question is, is there anything else besides the universe? Is there, are there other people? Are there other human souls? And is there a God? And if so, those are out there. They're not in here. I didn't invent you. I didn't invent God any more than I invented the universe. What is it that the sexual revolution sought to suppress then? The sense of sacredness, the sense that sex is an icon, a pointing finger that points to something mysterious, something beyond itself, that it's more than animal sex, that it is a kind of ecstasy by which you can stand outside yourself and in a natural and human way uh, have a kind of analogy to the mystical experience of, of bridal union with God that we're all programmed for. We need that. We need something more than just contentment and peace and, and solving our problems. We need to be a little crazy. We need to go out of our mind in the right sense. So and, how, and so the, the pleasure of sex and, the, and, and the, the, the amazing thing that happens in that union uh, that attracts people to it so much points beyond it, is what you're saying. It's, it's like drugs, which are much more obviously self-destructive, but why are drugs attractive? Uh, well, I don't know, I've never done them, but from what I've read, uh, it's not simply that it gives you pleasure, and can, it certainly doesn't give you contentment. Mm -hmm. it, it puts you out of your mind. It gives you ecstasy, standing outside yourself. Now, the essence of, of a moral life, of a, of a saintly life, is another kind of standing outside yourself. Agape love means identifying with the other, focusing on the other, loving the other, identifying with the other. And that too is a kind of ecstasy. And that also gives you a tremendous joy. Yeah. So if you put sex and love together, you get the traditional philosophy of, of, of sex and marriage. If you separate them in opposite directions, uh, both become perverted. Yeah. The, how do we regain a sense of the sacred in that area, in a culture that's, you know, pornography is ubiquitous, and, and, and it's all about pursuing your own pleasure, and a lot, of, a lot of, I know in a man's world, it's the woman's an object, you know, and you pursue a particular woman because you want to use her for your pleasure. That's very common yep. in our society. Fortunately, you're not just asking me, you're asking the church, and the church has responded with the theology of the body of John Paul II, yeah. which George Weigel said is maybe, maybe the most important theological development since Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. It's the church's answer to the sexual revolution. Now, there's, I, know it, I know it's enormous, I know it's enormous, the body of work he did there, but what are some of the key things that he points to that help us regain a sense of the sacred in terms of human sexuality? That you focus on the person, uh, that persons are ends to be loved and respected, not means to be used, that sex is an icon of the inner life of the Trinity and therefore holy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the big picture surrounding Humanae Vitae. Mm -hmm. Humanae Vitae was perfectly correct, but it confined itself to legal natural law arguments. Mm -hmm. And it's the justification for that picture. Uh, very few Catholics understood the beauty of Humanae Vitae, even if they agreed with it. But almost everybody who studies the theology of the body falls in love with it. Why didn't Humanae Vitae grab the mind and the heart? Because it was a natural law argument for people like so many Catholics. The reason I'm saying that, so many Catholics don't practice it. They don't follow it. They don't... I, I don't know, but I tend to think that Paul VI, being a very good man, was a little naive, and he assumed that Catholics were faithful enough to say, well, if, if it can be shown that this is the will of God, the will of the church, the will of Christ, and the natural law, they'll be faithful. And they weren't. Yeah. They wanted more. And John Paul II gave them more. Yeah. Why is it, it's almost become, it's like society seems to be obsessed by sex. We sell cars by it, we sell beer by it, we do everything by it. Mm -hmm. What is being communicated there? 
Well, I think it's a confusion between sex and money. Uh, sex is something that you use to sell things. And money is something that we expect to get pregnant by itself. <laughs> so it's reverse. There's the, it's the whole thing is reverse. Yeah. Saying. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's a, there's a, sp I, there's a spiritual uh, power that's at work kind of driving the sexual revolution in many ways. And you, you talked at one point in one of your books about it, the devil's seven-step strategy, mm. you know, to really win souls. I mean, that's what it came down to. You kind of had the picture mm -hmm. about, you know, God's, God desires eternal souls and the devil desires eternal souls. And what we're seeing, we're living through a great battle for yeah. souls. Well, I think that's pretty clear. The, the sociological and psychological motives for the sexual revolution are kind of confused. But the, uh, the supernatural motives are very clear. The devil wants to corrupt human souls and win them away from God for hell. One way to do that is to corrupt society because we're so dependent on other people. And the thing that holds every society together more than anything else is the family. Uh, there's never been a healthy society without healthy family. And what holds the family together is stable marriages. And what holds a marriage together is sexual fidelity. So if the sexual revolution can undermine that, it's undermining everything. It's not just a personal issue. It's not just a, a, a social issue. It's an eternal issue. And what it leaves is, you see in the wake of the sexual revolution, we've been talking uh, this week here at a conference we're attending, talking about, in part, breakup of the family. You see a whole set of things that come as a result of the sexual revolution. Uh, the revolution itself, abortion, divorce, same-sex marriage, porn, demographic winter. Are these even things like embryonic stem cell research and, and transhumanism that's all of a sudden on, are all these things connected? And if so, why and how are they connected? It's all part of what the Pope calls the culture of death as opposed to the culture of life. Death separates what life unites. Death separates the body and the soul. So you prepare for death if you have an instrumental view of sex. My body is an instrument that can give my soul pleasure. The essence of sex is the purely spiritual feeling of excitement. And I will manipulate my body and your body in order to give us that. That's, that's a preparation for death, that's separation of soul and body. And how do these, how do the, these other manifestations of it, something like embryonic stem cell research, that the church was trying to, to tell the country, to help the country understand that, that there's a living person there and somehow they can't see it. They're all perversions of nature. They're all treating something in nature as what it isn't, treating a person as if it's not a person, uh, treating something sacred as if it's not sacred, treating marriage as if it's not necessarily heterosexual. That's, that's like saying that triangles should be free to have a fourth side and still remain triangles. Mm. And, and the skeptical philosophy that says we can't know the natures of things buys into that or becomes the foundation of that. Yeah. So it feeds the desire, it feeds, the, feeds into the spiritual battle. It's part of the lack of clarity of the truth and well, the foundation it, of things. It's a rationalization for it. Yeah. We want the so-called fruits of the sexual revolution. In order to justify them, we have to be relativists and, and postmodernists, so we deny truth. Yeah. We deny that we can know the natures of things. Yeah. Well, you know, Peter, Dr. Kraft really gives like the big picture I mean, you both were doing that, really, just giving the big picture. Yeah, and he's got great clarity on it. I think we, we have to lay hold of the big picture because we're losing hold of the big picture, and that has huge ramifications for us. Yeah, you know, the reality of the devil, the reality of distorting and twisting things and reversing things and being skeptical about things, it's just really, uh, really incredible. And it's, it's amazing when you sit and talk with somebody who, who it is so clear in their mind and he's able to bring it forward. And I think the root of it, you know, we were talking about the root of what we're facing is a spiritual battle. Yeah. And the fundamental thing is the suppression of the truth about God. And when you suppress the truth about the designer, clarity about the design gets lost. You know? yeah. And there is back, we're kind of back in the garden. Amen. You know? Well, we're going to give people some ammunition for dealing with the confusion that we're finding in our culture today. We're going to tell you how you can get a free booklet from Peter Herbeck and then we'll be right back. At the heart of the new evangelization is the proclamation of the gospel, which St. Paul describes as the power of God for salvation. Brothers and sisters, it's the good news about the person of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Recent popes have reminded us that all believers, by virtue of their baptism, have been personally commissioned and sent by Jesus to tell others about him. 
In my new booklet, The New Evangelization, What's Our Message? I outline the essential elements of the gospel in a clear and concise way that makes the message accessible to you and can help you convey it to others. To receive your free copy of What's Our Message, visit our website at renewalministries.net or call 1-800-282-4789. Join us in sharing this good news. God bless you. Welcome back. Every time you hear truth, you got to think about two things. One is, how can I apply this to my life? And the other thing we need to think about is, who do I know that I need to share this with? And that's why we're making the booklet available. It's really good for getting your own head clear about what the basic gospel message is, but it's also really good as a resource for sharing with others. Well, Peter, what are some of your uh, thoughts about what people can do about the confusion in our culture and the just the, the mess that, that good, our culture is becoming. Yeah. No, good question. Well, one of the things we can do is to regain confidence in the word, word of God itself, its truth. The whole idea that our culture wants to obliterate uh, the, con the concept of truth and that everybody has their own truth. We need to just stand against it. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. We need to, again, have confidence in God's word, confidence in the teaching of the church, especially regarding the fun fundamental things we were talking about today, like the battle for the family and what's happening there. And as Dr. Kraft was saying, that you destroy the family, you destroy civilization. And we are literally moving one step at a time, it seems like, through the, 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 the uh, destruction of our own culture and our own civilization. And the only way back from that is to lay hold of the truth again and to live it. And it's to open our hearts as Jesus' disciples and say, Lord, what is the truth that you've revealed about human sexuality? What's the truth that you've revealed about marriage? What's the truth you revealed about the family? I want to receive that truth and I want to live it radically. And I want to live it with confidence and I want to help other people understand it and experience it. Right, and you know, a, a lot of people, Peter, you know, have made mistakes in this area, have, have broken families, have, have have damaged themselves through sexual immorality. And the great thing about Jesus Christ is that there's hope for everybody, no matter what the wounds of sin have, have inflicted, no matter what the broken relationships have really made possible. Mercy is possible, forgiveness is possible, and no matter how broken we are, no matter how many mistakes we've made, no matter how fragmented our family is, it's never too late to come to the Lord and ask for mercy and forgiveness and ask for him for salvation, ask him for redemption, ask him to repair the wounds of sin, ask him to bring people back to himself where they can really find true life and abundant life. Until next week, this is Ralph Martin and Peter Herbeck wishing you the very best, a life of union with Jesus Christ and a desire to tell others about him. Next week, same time, same place, the choices we face. Mm -hmm.